Due to the global outbreak of the coronavirus, the Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees, so our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future as we reduce our staffing at VOA headquarters here in Washington. We appreciate your staying with us on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, you're welcome to a special edition of Straight Talk Africa. Coming to you from my home in Arlington, Virginia, a suburb of Washington, D.C. I am Shaka Sally, and today's topic is a candid conversation on the significance of the Southern African Development Community, or SADAC, an economic regional bloc based in Havarone, the capital of Botswana. Our distinguished guest is Dr. Stagomena Lawrence Taxi, the Executive Secretary of SADAC, the Southern African Development Community, or SADAC. Well, to be honest with you, uh, Ndugu Stagomena, I would like to say that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host you for the first time on this special edition of Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much. I am equally very delighted and honored to be given this opportunity. Thank you very much. You're most welcome, Doctor. Now, talk to me about uh, the recent important developments in your region. I gather, for example, that uh, in August, you reached a major milestone. You celebrated the 40th anniversary of the existence of SADAC. Walk us through some of the highlights, some of the major issues that were discussed during that summit. Thank you very much. Indeed, uh, we are very happy and very proud as a region to have uh, reached our 40 years, this uh, long journey. And uh, maybe before I go to what were the major highlights of uh, the 40th uh, summit, let me begin by just explaining what is uh, SADAC all about, where we started and how we have reached there. Um, it, we have a long history. The region, uh, the organization has a long history, as you might be aware. Uh, let me begin from uh, April 1980 when uh, the SADAC Development Coordination Conference, SADAC with double C, was established. By then, there was a declaration towards economic liberation. And then the intention was uh, we had uh, worked together as a, a number of countries within the region to fight for, economic, for political liberation. And the intention was to make sure that uh, all the countries which had not achieved political liberation, they do that. So through that uh, 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 cooperation, Namibia became liberated in 1990. And then uh, uh, well, the leaders decided now to form the current uh, SADAC in its current form, the Southern Africa Development Community, through a declaration in... Uh, August 19, 19, 1992, that was in Windhoek, Namibia. The first one was in Zambia. So since then, we agreed that uh, we are to cooperate to first to sustain our peace and security because it's very critical for us and the political stability, but also to accelerate uh, development and economic integration. So since then, there have been a number of uh, policies, strategies, protocols, which we have uh, put together, formulated, agreed upon, which we are implementing. So I'll go maybe as we proceed, I may highlight some of the successes. So the summit which we had in August on the 17th uh, this year, uh, that was uh, the 40th uh, summit starting from 1980. And among others, uh, let me begin by saying that uh, it was a, a historical summit in the sense that it was uh, convened virtually. That was uh, the first time in history of SADC, and that was because of uh, challenges posed by COVID-19. But it was very important to have that uh, summit. As a region, 
we agreed and we realized and we put together ourselves to say we here we are in a situation we are faced by COVID-19. That was uh, since uh, March when we had our first case in South, South Africa, which is the SADC member state. We say, no, we need to move forward. And as we move forward, what should we do? Immediately there was a decision that uh, from now on, we'll conduct our uh, regional activities virtually. But the summit was a different thing altogether. Really? Bringing together really? 16 heads of states in a virtual summit, it wasn't easy. And it was a bold decision to make. But we managed. Uh, people ask, why do, you, why do you feel that it was a difficult decision? Yes, uh, these are heads of states. You have to ensure their security. In terms of content, in terms of uh, physical security as well, we live in a cyber, uh, cyber sophisticated uh, environment, so it was a big job and a, a, a bold decision to take. Now, the major outcomes of uh, this summit first, um, we have reached, we had reached a stage where we are guided by two since, uh, uh, since uh, the past 15 years. The region has been guided uh, in terms of uh, strategic orientation by two major strategic uh, documents, which is uh, the SADC Regional Indicative Strategic Development Plan and the, the Development Plan, uh, Indicative Plan for the organ, organ on peace, security, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, political cooperation. So we had reached, the, this document had reached uh, their end. So it was very important uh, to have uh, successors, strategic uh, documents to move forward our regional integration. You talked, for example, about uh, SADC having, having been born in April 1980. That is very interesting, especially because it seems to have coincided with the political independence of Zimbabwe. Because the last time I checked, Zimbabwe was actually independent Zimbabwe gained its political independence on April 18, 1980. Is that correct? Yes, it's, it's true. Before mm. that, um, it seems to me that uh, those countries that formed the nucleus of SADC were referred to, if I remember correctly, as the frontline states. That is uh, very true, and there were uh, nine countries which were independent by then, and those were the frontline uh, states, uh, namely Angola, Botswana, Eswatini, Lesotho, Malawi, Mozambique, Tanzania, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, which gained independence at the same time. So those were the frontline states. Mm -hmm. And it's again because of the same reason, because it was now to make sure that uh, there were those who are we are not independent by then. They should also uh, obtain their independence. And also, of course, uh, to work towards the end of apartheid and essentially majority rule in South Africa. Is that correct? That is very correct. And that was part of uh, uh, ensuring that those who are, who are not independent by then, they also gain their independence. And that indeed, that happened. In 1994, when uh, the apartheid system collapsed, it was because of the solidarity, but also the work which was done by the Southern Africa De uh, Conference Coordination, which was established for that purpose, among others. I see. So what would you say that so far, uh, if you could put your fingers on it, what would you say so far are some of the major accomplishments by SADC? Uh, there are many. Uh, first is the uh, sustenance of solidarity, and uh, which also um, enabled uh, Namibia, but also South Africa. Namibia to gain uh, independence uh, started from 1980. That's where I'm starting from. But also the collapse of, um, of uh, apartheid in South Africa in 1994. Yeah, so that is one of uh, the major achievements but also, maybe one may not see it, but uh, for us, we feel that uh, maintaining peace and security in the region is one of uh, a major milestone, but also maintaining political stability is because of the solidarity we have, but also a number of our cooperation uh, that we have put in place. The other major achievement uh, is uh, from the economic front, we have uh, we established a free trade area, and we have managed to 
uh, to increase SADC intra-trade. Uh, the speed may not as what we wished, but uh, we are getting there. That is also one of their achievements. But again, we may, in terms of uh, our strength, is uh, on the peace and security, because uh, we have um, put in place mechanism of uh, conflict management, resolution, but also uh, democracy. As you may be aware, we are part of uh, uh, the force which is in the DRC under the United uh, uh, Nations. Uh, we have uh, three countries as we speak, but uh, there were others before these three countries which are there. We, we work together with the DRC. There are a lot of challenges, electoral challenges before the last elections, but we also supported our sister country to have uh, a peaceful elections. Yes, in the northern part of our DRC is not yet stable, but we are still there helping them. We intervene in uh, Madagascar. We managed to bring uh, the different parties together, and then there was a constitutional normalcy after a quite some time, which was mediated by His Excellency Chisano, just to mention a few. Mm -hmm. But also in Lesotho, we intervened. We, uh, we are still there facilitating. There have been a number of uh, change of administration, but uh, all of them have been done peacefully. And uh, now the orientation has been on uh, industrialization. Notwithstanding how uh, the free trade area, we realize that uh, we need to enhance our competitiveness and our productive capacity to utilize the free market, market which we have established. But there are a number. Those are just a few uh, achievements or milestones which we can say, indeed, we have been successful over the years. What about politically? Because um, it seems to me that uh, when you walk across the African continent and you basically look at uh, the democratization process, it seems to me that on balance, SADC probably has the upper hand. Because in SADC, you have clearly had elections that are considered to be free, fair, transparent, and credible, especially compared to the rest of the continent. What is the secret behind that? The secret first is the, uh, the appreciation we uphold democratic principles. Principles that is part of uh, our 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 principles as enshrined in the treaty. But people sometimes do underestimate the importance of the SADC electro observation missions. They they start they start perception out there that we just go there. It's like a formality. That is not true at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, this also has added value to the democratic uh, and the governance uh, systems which you see in our region. Uh, our, our observation is done in three phases. The first phase, you go there um, uh, three, four, five months before. What you do, you just assess the preparedness of that country to go to elections with a view of establishing whether the, the elections are going to be credible. What we assess, we assess uh, the security situation, the legislature, uh, the legislature, I mean, the legislature, the law governing elections, and also the political environment. And based on that, would there be any issues we immediately communicate to our member states that these are the issues which we feel that you should look into before elections? During elections, during elections we will assess um, the processes, but thereafter, again, uh, we will assess post and uh, provide a report. Now, when we go, uh, before we go, we start a next round of elections, we always start to ask by assessing, did you improve the areas which we are, we are, we are recommended for improvement? And the member said they know that we are very serious with that. They take the report seriously and they, they rectify what has to be rectified before the next round of elections. So that has helped a lot. When you talk about um, democracy, how do you respond to some skeptics who say, in terms of democracy, there is an elephant in the room, and that that elephant in the room 
is Zimbabwe. How do you react to that? <laughs> if we say that there is an elephant in the room, then now we should say there is an elephant in the region, there is an elephant in the continent, and there is an elephant globally. Because democracy is interpreted differently. It depends on uh, how do you want to interpret a democracy. And a democracy doesn't take, a, it takes a number of stakeholders to come together and say this is democracy and this is how we are supposed to move together. Zimbabwe, I have heard a lot about Zimbabwe. But uh, the unfortunate part, people tend, and uh, now we have social media, people tend to listen to one party without listening to both parties, analyzing and say, okay, indeed, there is a challenge here in terms of democracy. Zimbabwe has held elections throughout, democratic elections, and uh, even the last, uh, the last Last uh, change of administration was done democratically. It wasn't uh, that uh, um, uh, the former president was forced out. That was agreed. He stepped down. So I don't understand when we say that there's no democracy in Zimbabwe. Uh, maybe if I may be enlightened, what do we mean that there's an elephant in the room, which is uh, Zimbabwe? For us, democratic principles have been upheld by all member states, not only Zimbabwe. I happen to be one of those um, journalists that uh, had the honor and the opportunity to cover the last election in Zimbabwe. And there were a lot of complaints, especially because the, one of the major complaints was that uh, clearly the political playing field was not leveled. That in fact, you had the ruling party the ruling party dominated the media. The ruling party had all the money that uh, you need in order to campaign. The ruling party was virtually, at least in the words of some of the critics, competing against people whose hands were tied behind their backs and their legs tied together. How do you react to that? We, as I indicated that uh, we do our assessment, when we did our assessment, uh, we interacted with a number of stakeholders. What you are saying, that was said by a certain segment, especially some of the political um, parties. But when you interacted with uh, other stakeholders in the civil society, um, diplomatic uh, missions, and other organization, you had a different story altogether. But again, we had to to investigate it to get a, a clear and a balanced uh, picture. Mm. And the, 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 the information that uh, there was no equal uh, access to media, that was not correct at all. And that uh, there was excess use of uh, forces, the military was part of it, that was not, at, was not correct at all. They used police because that police is the, the, the institution, the security institution, which is uh, entrusted with uh, law and order. But uh, again, uh, the the last election, the one of the the opposition party was not uh, did not accept the the what the results. They went to court, and the court uh, ruled. So you have three pillars of government. They work independently. So as Sadak, we respect the rule of law. We respect the constitutions of uh, member states are uh, holding elections, and uh, there are also electoral law. And as far as we are concerned, everything was uh, done in, in line with the constitutional and the, the legislation. In the report, which I have just referred, that uh, we normally undertake a pre-assessment, those issues were part of that. And uh, personally, I, I had a, a meeting with uh, the current president, and I convened, I mean, I, I, I present that report. And uh, he said, I can see you're very ahead of us. You are you are saying that uh, we did not uh, amend this, uh, we did not uh, uh, implement your recommendations of the previous, uh, the previous um, uh, report. We amended this law, this section, and he was specific to point. Mm. Frankly speaking, I felt very embarrassed that here I am, I'm using a report which I have gathered uh, information from stakeholders, and uh, here are the facts coming from the highest level and it means that uh, we have to do our job very well before we we we, we communicate. So sometimes uh, you get when you get these uh, reports, eh, mm. 
if you don't get a feedback and you got you don't balance your report you may end up being really misguided so that is what i can say that uh, indeed for us we feel that uh, the zimbabwe elections or the elections have been done electro i mean democratically in line with uh, the guiding uh, legislation let's talk about uh, the challenges uh, posed by the covid 19. what are some of the challenges that so far uh, have been caused by the covid 19 in your region and how have you been able to address some of those problems? The challenges are multiple, as uh, you know. At the beginning, we thought that our challenges may be COVID-19 was, uh, was about, uh, it was health related only. But then we realized that that is not the case and we moved us swiftly. So first is the uh, unavailability of uh, um, uh, drugs but also equipment for COVID-19. But we have mobilized ourselves and we are addressing that. But more importantly now is the social economic impact of it. We undertook, uh, we carried out a study, which uh, was one of uh, the issues which were deliberated upon by the last, uh, the just ended summit. And it has been very clear that uh, there are multiple challenges in terms of food security, in terms of uh, increased um, gender-based violence, in terms of um, a number of uh, economic sectors also has been impacted. Just uh, to mention a few, tourism, trade, and what have you just mentioned a few. But what we have done as a region first was to quickly mobilize resources to address uh, the, the health, uh, the health uh, part of it but also uh, to put in place uh, measures to address, uh, the, uh, the, the, to address the socioeconomic impact. And more significantly, which was very clear and which was uh, the major, the first one to observe was the uh, impact on trade. Because of, because of COVID-19, there were a number of uh, lockdowns. Mm -hmm. And uh, we could not uh, move, um, movement of goods and services was, uh, uh, was uh, constrained including essential goods uh, for COVID-19. So what we did quickly was uh, to put in place uh, guidelines which uh, enabled the region to facilitate movement of uh, essential goods, but gradually we realized that uh, COVID-19 is not a temporary phenomenon. It is here to stay. So the guidelines were expanded to facilitate uh, movement of uh, goods and services overall. And that has helped uh, to a certain extent to contain the negative impact on our trade, but also to contain the negative impact on uh, on uh, on uh, on uh, the uh, the balance sheet of our economies. Talking about uh, the economy, I realize that, uh, for example, South Africa has been very very badly hit. Its economy, for example, has pretty much tanked. It has lost 51 percent. Doesn't that pose a potential problem of unemployment? And especially given that uh, South Africa, in part, depends largely on tourism. And when you talk about uh, the COVID-19, no tourist, sincerely, in their right mind, would want to visit South Africa, or the region for that matter. Yeah, I wouldn't wish uh, to speak uh, specifically on a specific country. But uh, that is very true that uh, COVID-19 has impacted a number of uh, sectors, tourism being one of them. But it's not only tourism, manufacturing sector, because the uh, industry could not uh, proceed, manufacturing sector has been affected. As, uh, as indicated, uh, also uh, food security has severely been impacted. So there are a number of uh, sectors which have been impacted. Obviously, that uh, affects the economy as a whole, including employment as one of uh, the subsectors of the economy, not only in South Africa, in a number of our countries, Southern African uh, countries. So walk us back to the 40th anniversary. What did the summit ultimately decide on how to address these important issues of trade, of unemployment, or food security, for example? The, the food security, we have a program which was uh, we agreed as part of uh, the study which I have mentioned. We had a number of recommendations in a number of sectors, 
In the area of food security, we agree that uh, we need uh, to enhance the program which is there. But more importantly also to, because food security, COVID-19 is just one of them, one of the issues. But uh, the, as you know, the region has been hit also by climate change. So there are a number of uh, areas, I mean, a number of intervention in terms of uh, adaptation, but also mitigating the impact of climate change as part of that program to enhance our food security. In, uh, in, uh, in uh, the finance sector, there are also a number of uh, interventions, including re-looking at our microeconomic convergence, not to change, but to see what we can do in the interim, mm. but also uh, reaching out our partners that, okay, we have a number of programs with you. We have also some, 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 some um, financial arrangement. Let us see how we can, uh, we can soften the arrangement during this time while we are faced with COVID, uh, the, COVID, the pandemic. So there are a number of uh, issues which we agreed upon as part of that big picture of addressing the social economic impact of COVID-19. Dr. Star Omena Lawrence Taxi, let's talk about you. You have made history. The last time I checked, when I was doing my homework, I realized that uh, you are the first female Executive Secretary of SADAC since its inception. If true, how has it been to be in that position, <laughs> Executive Secretary of SADAC, as the first female Chief Executive? I was humbled uh, to be appointed as the first uh, female Executive Secretary, and uh, I extend my gratitude to my leaders in the region the heads of state of SADAC. But that is also, we can take it as an achievement because among, I had indicated that uh, through our journey, as part of our journey of uh, regional integration, we ent we have entered into about 33 uh, protocols. One of them is a protocol on gender. So this is a uh, part of the implementation of uh, gender in our region, gender mainstreaming, gender equity. Uh, among others, uh, the gender recognized uh, gender parity and the minimum threshold is 30%. Uh, so um, we have, in, a number of our countries have uh, reached that stage. We have some countries which have reached 50-50. So I was very humbled and I'm very happy. But uh, what I have uh, faced, uh, it is a mixed, it's mixed feelings. On one hand, you feel happy that you have this opportunity to save the region. But on the other hand, uh, also it goes with its only challenges, which you need to be prepared to address them. How does it feel like, really, to be the first female chief executive? And what has been the response so far from the people in the region? Whether we like it or we don't like it, it is very true that uh, when you are appointed as a female leader, you have to understand that uh, the first thing which comes to, especially you men, you'll be looking, me, you'll be looking at me as a, a female. And then... Uh, Later, the next part will be now you're looking me at the executive secretary. So that was the first thing to say, okay, I have a double assignment, if I may call it assignment. I have to do and to deliver mm -hmm. on my responsibilities as the executive secretary. But also I have another challenge of, uh, of uh, showing that I'm not a female. I'm a human being like any other human being. Mm. So I have to be considered as a, as a human being. So by working very hard to ensure that indeed you deliver and you you deliver on your mandate and you move forward. So that is uh, the only challenge which I normally see. But uh, what, you, what, you, what you should do is just to be confident, is just to work, and is also to not to waste time or to accept uh, people who would wish to drill you simply because you are a female. Just be focused and proceed with your work. Time is not our best ally, so we'll go for a break. And when we come back, we shall continue with the conversation. So please, don't go away. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. 
connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on VOA. Today's topic is a candid conversation on the significance of the Southern African Development Community, or SADAC, an economic regional bloc based in Havarone, the capital of Botswana. Our distinguished guest is Dr. Stagomena Lawrence Taxi, the Executive Secretary of SADAC, the Southern African Development Community. If you were to talk to us from the deepest, better part of the bottom of your Tanzanian heart and soul, what would you say are the sort of qualifications, the sort of qualities that one needs, whether they are female or male, to become a successful executive secretary of the regional economic bloc? First and foremost, integrity. You have to be a person of integrity. And integrity is very broad. Secondly, you have to be, I have said this, you have to be uh, also to be confident. Also, you have to be, and this is now a Tanzanian part of it, you have to be humble. Mm -hmm. You have to understand that, uh, yes, I'm a leader, but I'm a human being like any other, anybody else. You have to exude, so humbleness. You have to exude. The uh, humbleness is very critical. You have to exude humility. Humility and humbleness are different. Yes, you may call it humility, but I'm calling it humbleness. It's just to be humble. Mm. And, you, uh, and to be a great listener, yeah. perhaps. A greater listener goes without. It's not about being Tanzania. I think that is for any leader. You have uh, to listen attentively. But also you have to be, you have to, you have to listen, but also to be understanding. You may listen, but if you are not understanding, you may just listen and it ends there. You have to listen. You have to be able to analyze what you are listening, and how to respond at what point in time and how. So listening it goes with a number of other uh, characteristics or element which makes you a good listener, but also a good uh, implementer after listening. What is your day like, a typical day like? Uh, could you please uh, kindly walk us through a day in the life of Dr. <laughs> Sargomena Lawrence Taxi? What time, for example, do you go to uh, bed? And what time do you wake up? I don't have a day like. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> And maybe even uh, going back to the question before I go to the day, like when you ask about um, as a female executive uh, secretary first, what did I, the, there is a point which I also wanted to, to, to bring about is that uh, it's not true that uh, there is also this myth that uh, um, female do not support each other. It's not true. First, uh, I, I got support from uh, my leaders. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel anything from that I'm, I'm, I'm being treated uh, differently from uh, the leaders of uh, this, uh, this organization, mm -hmm. and I'm very appreciative for that. I got all the support. I got all the support from the team, but also from female uh, leaders. I got all the support, so that myth uh, is, isn't there. Uh, the challenge which I explained that uh, sometimes you're looked upon as a leader, there will be few individuals who will be doing that, and that's where you should not uh, be drilled. Now, what is my day like? It depends. It's, uh, this is a very demanding job, as you may uh, know. So they are, ordinarily, I have, to be, I have to wake up at around 6. I have to be in the office at 7, 7.30, 7.30. And then uh, also it depends. I may work, the official time is uh, 4.30, but I don't recall any day that I knocked off at 4.30. It will be always uh, after 8. Sometimes um, 8 is uh, maybe when I'm early. Hmm. And again, it depends. Some of the days it may be light. You may be dealing with uh, documentation. But some of the days may be very, very intense. 
even if you're not uh, reading a document, but intense your, in your mind, because you have issues which you need now to address. Now you, you'll be struggling to say, how do I address this? How do I do? What approach should I do? What methodology should I do? Whom should I contact? Whom should I reach out? So it depends on the issues and it, it depends on the day. But um, in most cases, it is a, it, every day is a busy day with a different dynamics. Now, in your position, there are a lot of people who look at you as a positive role model, and especially a positive role model for the girl child. If, for example, some of the young girls and women in your home area of Mwanza, the beauty... Oh, you know my home area. <laughs> yes, I've done a little bit homework about you. The beautiful <laughs> lakeside shores of Lake Victoria. If there was a young girl right there, and another one in Magomeni near Dar es Salaam, Munaz Moja, and they wanted to walk in your shoes, they wanted to be like you, what advice would you have for them? First and foremost, education. Make sure that uh, you work hard and uh, you get uh, the right education. When you are given an opportunity to go to school, please use it. Secondly, be disciplined as a girl. There will be a number of uh, temptations here and there do not uh, allow any temptation in your life. Be hardworking, and as you grow, allow yourself to be confident. Don't allow anybody to degrade you. So those will be my 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 word of uh, advice to a young girl. Very interesting, uh, <laughs> Doctor Stagomena Lawrence Taxi. You also happen to be, in fact, to belong to an elite of intellectuals. You are the recipient of an earned doctorate, doctorate of philosophy from Japan. Wow. You know a lot about me. <laughs> I know some things about you. Who inspired you to look that far? A lot of people, they can't wait to get the first university degree and use it as a passport for upward social economic mobility. But you, in fact, dared to get a doctorate of philosophy. What inspired you? My, my parents, especially my mother, they were my mother was a teacher, so maybe that's why I emphasize education. So for her, education was everything. Mm. My father was equally a teacher, but my mother was a teacher, and he, she was my teacher as well. So you can imagine being a, a child of a teacher. Well, I don't know. Those who have been uh, <laughs> a children of teachers, they know what you, you, you go through. Because always uh, you are expected to be the best. Even where you can't be the best, you're expected to be the best. But also my mother was uh, not only being a teacher, she was, uh, may, I'll be seen as if maybe um, because she's my mother, I'm biased, but she was uh, a very loving lady. She's late, she passed away four years ago, and also a Christian. So those, a combination of those they modeled me in uh, a person I am now. And uh, since, uh, since my childhood, I have wanted to be someone I've wanted to have the education which I can uh, afford. I remember because of that, uh, once before joining uh, university, I once uh, we went to the university at the same uh, time with my young brother. Because of uh, certain um, challenges, uh, we found ourselves that we are in the same year. Mm. So I told my mother that I'm also going to, he, he was uh, the first to be selected. And then I said, my, 